Welcome in to Candlestick Chronicles, a 49ers podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I am Kyle Madsen, and I write about the 49ers for NinersWire.com, part of the USA Today Sports Media Group. Uh, joining me, as always, now that he's, uh, you were back last time. You've been home. I don't have to make a joke about you being home. I don't know, man. I'm. It's, you're just, you're just I, like, I barely know these days stone. because my body is, my body feels like I've been traveling constantly. Sure. And I, you might hear it in my voice. It sounds like I've been somebody who's been traveling a lot. I think I was back last week, though, when we were recording. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely the case, because I made the same joke yeah. about like, oh, hey, you're finally home. Which is funny, because later in the week, I will decidedly not be home, and I'm not sure if I'm going to bring my mic. And then I, the week that after game's... that, I will not be home. I will be across the world. Yeah, you'll be on the other side of the world. That'll be that's going to be fun for you, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to the looking forward to that for you uh same same pretty excited about it but not nearly as excited i am as i am to be sponsored by lamb chops sglambchops.com <laughs> is the website if you're watching on youtube you'll notice chris and i both rocking our lamb chops hoodies as we speak uh, chris i don't want to speak for you i know for me my hoodie is my favorite article of clothing i wore my lamb chops hoodie to my other one my green one i wore it to work today i'm just lamb chops out bro it's great uh, the one you're wearing, I loved it so much that I had to buy a second one. Um, I do wear a lot of black, and uh, so I had to get it black on black lamb chop sweaty in addition to my ash gray. Um, huge fan wearing lamb chop sweats. Uh, in addition, I rock the sweat shorts. April, I'm finding it's only been a day, but I've, I wore them all last April too. April is a great time for the sweat short, whether you're yeah. in the house running errands zippered pockets i mean you know you know if you know you know about the uh about the lamb chop shorts and as it gets warmer the mesh shorts who the best i can't wait pattern to go the pattern the pattern mesh shorts they are impossible to beat a uh, huge fan of those so shout out to, to lamb chops for keeping us fitted and um and comfortable and in quality clothing and of course having all of our items secure in those zippered pockets yeah super important and if Chris said, if you know, you know, on the lamb chop shorts, if you don't know, well, now's the time to know. Visit sglambchops.com today. <laughs> Use promo code candlestick20 and get 20% off your order. Get some shorts to your front door right now, whether you're doing yard work, lounging around the house, going out grocery shopping. Maybe you got a party to go to, a little pool party action this summer, a little cookout. Maybe you're golfing. I golf in my lamb chop shorts all the time. They are so versatile and uh, comfortable they look great and i know you'll love them so visit sglambchops.com today use promo code candlestick20 and get 20 percent off your order we're also sponsored by prize picks chris i gotta tell you prizepicks.com slash candlestick promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to 100 dollars. and chris i gotta tell you with baseball season going on i've been raking it in bro i crush <laughs> at daily fantasy baseball it turns out. Were you picking the the more thens on Estuary Ruiz? No, no, I decided not to do that. <laughs> no, I've been I've been doing a great job with uh, Nerfies, no run first innings, mm. or uh, I'm sorry, less than half a run in the first inning is what the entry is what the entry typically is. So it's two pitchers that they they combine and you pick more or less than half a run scored in an inning. What's alarming is how often pitchers give up more than a run in the first inning or more than half a run in the first inning mm. it is crazy how often a run gets scored i would i would definitely pick the guys who who have a little bit of extra velo in those first innings because yeah. you know the best pitchers in the league they'll throw a lot of fastballs in the first the first time through an order and then maybe as the game goes on they'll start mixing in some slide pieces um some hooks some change-ups, um, but the guys with with the the high velocity uh, who get going early on, those are the guys who I would ride with in those scenarios, Kyle. Yeah, dude. Um, so everybody heed that advice as you're putting together your <laughs> daily fantasy entries. Uh, I've been combining them with with basketball too. It's been just just a real a real humdinger of a hoot nanny. And the other thing is the women's college basketball tournament grabbing the more than 
points on Caitlin Clark, Paige Beckers, Juju Watson, pick your flaw J Johnson, who pick your favorite women's college basketball player. Uh, picking the more than on those just makes it even more electric when they start to, when they start cooking in those games. So join us at prize picks, prizepickscom slash candlestick. Use promo code candlestick for a first deposit match up to $100 prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, let's talk about the NFL draft. We've got some takes. Okay, so here's what I think the 49ers are going to do. I think they're going to stand pat at number 31. Oh, interesting. Okay, we disagree on this. Yes. Elaborate. So I believe that they're going to stand pat on 31 and take probably the best defensive lineman available or perhaps... If there's an offensive tackle prospect they really like that they don't think will make it to the second round, maybe they just reach for him at 31. Or maybe they try and trade back a couple of spots if they're super confident that they can they can do that. But the issue I see with trading up is they would need to get so far up the board to get a prospect worth trading up for that I don't know that they'll be able to swing such a deal. If my, if, and I've done a million mock drafts, I've read a million mock drafts. If I've read all the stuff from, from some guy with the last name Marino, who's been gathering Intel on the sneak (laughs) and uh, you know, lesser known guys like Daniel Jeremiah and (laughs) I, I, (laughs) I I I think that the best tackle prospects are all going to be off the board by like pick twenty, and I don't know if the Niners can get up inside the top twenty from thirty one. I up. think that's fair. Um, so I actually did a a modicum of draft work over the last few days, and wow, really by draft it. work I mean reading scouting reports cross-checking it with some YouTube clips um, and, you know, doing a little bit of diligence uh, on these prospects. My take on what the, what I think the 49ers are going to do is I think they are going to identify somebody they really like who they think could be had anywhere between pick 20 and 25 and then trade up. Maybe it's use their third round pick and maybe a couple of their fourth round picks Um, or whatever it would take to get up to identify a player that they like. I think I would be surprised, honestly, if the 49ers did pick at 31 because I think Hmm. their needs are are so specific that it's not really a scenario for them, in my opinion, where they can just sit back and allow things to unfold and just – take the best player at a position that they they might want to invest in and just take that guy. I think whether it's a tackle prospect, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably a little less bullish on some of these tackle prospects than a lot, like a lot of people seem to just assume, you know, guys like <clears throat> Amarius Mims or JC Latham or even mm-hmm. Taylor Guyton or just like, because they have the physical tools that make them first round prospects. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're necessarily, necessarily first round players. Like if I'm the 49ers, I'm not drafting somebody who I think is a project. And I think some of these, some of these tackle prospects feel to me like projects and what the 49ers need is somebody that they can draft and plug in at a position of need right away. Like this is Mm -hmm. not a team that's, you know, it's not 2017 where the Niners are just like, let's, let's draft guys and just develop all of them. Like, no, they need guys in the draft to contribute from a high level right away, which is why I think they're going to be selective in terms of what they're looking for. It's not going to be, you know, who who has the traits that we like. It's going to be who's a really good football player that we feel like can play high-level football right now. Um, so for me, uh, and I didn't think this going in, but doing some reading and, and watching um, and, and trying to just find the logic and pairing it with the needs here, I think a guy the 49ers are going to really like and could potentially trade up for in the mid-20s um, would be Jackson Powers Johnson, the center from Oregon. Hmm. Um, and I have to think at some point Kyle Shanahan is going to decide 
Like, you know what? Maybe I should make a substantial investment in the middle of my offensive line. That's that's you know well beyond Alex Mack. And they did with Weston Richburg, but that obviously didn't really pan out because of, because of injuries. But I just think having Brock Purdy now as you know a young quarterback still on his rookie deal, being able to pair him with a center who could potentially be your center for the next eight, ten years, whatever. Mm-hmm. Somebody who fits the scheme, right? Who can shade, who can get on the side of a defensive tackle and block a wide zone running play, or who can mm-hmm. advance to the second level, block linebackers and safeties and even corners on some of these runs that the 49ers like to do, sure. um, and also be really good in pass protection. To me, that's a worthwhile investment. And if you really like Jake Brendel, like the 49ers seem to really like Jake Brendel, I believe he has one more year left on his contract. Maybe you play Jackson Powers Johnson at right guard, and that upgrades sure. your right guard position. I, I just think, or, or do you put him at center and put Jake Brendel into the right guard mix? Yeah, I mean you have that optionality too, right? Like I, I just think, given you know Kyle Shanahan has gone as as long as he has without making really substantial investments along the interior of the offensive line, and I know they drafted Aaron Banks in the second round. And I know they brought in Alex Mack. I know they brought in Weston Richard. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like, like it felt like those were options that were just kind of available to them. It mm. didn't feel like this was them earnestly going out and saying, "No, we are going to upgrade the interior of the offensive line." This like you, utilizing a first round pick on that position just feels different, right? Yeah. And I don't know that Jackson Powers Johnson is going to be the next Jason Kelsey. But I do know that the 49ers would benefit in a great way if they were to draft a center, even if it wasn't round one, who ended up being a eight-year starter who played at a high level from the jump and mm-hmm. could solidify the interior when, you know, in the last few seasons when they've made their deep runs into the playoffs, it's been Chris Jones and Aaron Donald basically ruining their chances at winning a Super Bowl um, because of the way they play and if you solidify that whether it's at center or whether it's at guard yeah who knows if the if there was better communication between the center and guard spot potentially late in the chiefs game when chris mm-hmm. jones came in free right and that was a that was a play that was screwed up mm-hmm. um by spencer burford like is that a scenario that you could avoid if you improve that spot with somebody like jackson powers johnson so i don't know that i'm not predicting that he's gonna be the pick but I use him as sort of an example to say, I think the 49ers are at a spot where they're going to identify somebody that they like and they're going to trade up and go get him. And maybe it's not him. You know, maybe sure. it's Graham. Maybe it's Graham Barton. You know, mm-hmm. maybe they like Graham Barton from, from Duke Dark. because of his yeah. versatility. He can play tackle guard and center. Um, but in terms of like, you know, Amarius Mims or JC Latham, some of these guys who are also Tyler Guyton who are being projected to, you know, to, to go at the end of the first round, it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. they have tools, but are we absolutely positive? They're good football players. And when it comes to somebody like Jackson powers, Johnson, I feel pretty comfortable saying this guy is going to be a good football player. And I think a good football player immediately helps the 49ers maybe more so than a project would. Okay. So two, two, two quick things. Uh, One, uh, Jake Brendel last year just signed a four year deal. His guaranteed okay. salary ends after this year, but he signed through 2026. But it, and what's the not, dollar amount? It's it, not a lot. It is four four hundred four, just over four million a year. So it's not it's not an outrageous number if they think that Jackson Powers Johnson is going to come in and be their starting center for a decade. Sure. That that said, I completely agree with you on the high floor they would trade a high floor for a low ceiling with with their pick this year in the first round. And I think if they're going to trade up, I think what we'll probably see is maybe they include a first rounder next year where they're getting into a substantial area of the draft. Because I don't know that uh, maybe Jackson Powers Johnson is there at 25 or something. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I've, I've, it varies depending on who you ask where he's going to go. I kind of think he would be, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's center is not typically a position that, that people are – like, look at Creed Humphrey. He's one of the best centers in the league, and I think he went in the second round. So right. I, I get there's a positional value thing there, but that may be a reason the 49ers aren't super eager to trade up for, for a player like that. 
where if they're going to move up, I, I think it would be more likely where, and I know that you weren't necessarily, this is a little bit going along with what you were saying. I think they'd be more likely to trade up for like a defensive lineman or a defensive tackle that they thought could contribute right away. I think they'd be more liable to do that than trade up for an interior lineman. I think it would be center specific. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think they would do it for, for a long-term guard, right? Like, I don't think yeah, yeah, yeah. even sure. if Quentin Nelson was in this draft. I, I, I think it's kind of center specific because Kyle Shanahan had Alex Mack in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, he was good enough for him there that he brought him in mm -hmm. to obviously play for the Niners. Like, they, they did pay for Western Richburg. He's, Kyle Shanahan understands the value of centers and tackles. Yeah, right. And seems to be less inclined to invest significant resources in guards if they like jake brendel which it seems like the 49ers do mm -hmm. yeah then maybe brendel's your starting right guard maybe he he offers you an upgrade over spencer burford and john feliciano or jackson powers johnson just plays right guard and then you operate that way i i just think there's you know improving you have three spots along the interior of the offensive line one of them is aaron banks which is seems pretty solidified right. even yep. the way banks is played and the other two i feel like could absolutely be upgraded and like yeah, yeah maybe you draft maybe you draft a tackle i certainly would not blame them for wanting to draft a tackle i just don't know that any of these dudes at the back end of the first round are going to be legitimate long-term guys yeah and yeah maybe you know, maybe you do, to your point, maybe you do trade a first round pick next year to get up to a top 15 area mm -hmm. if you really like a guy. Mm -hmm. um, but you better not miss. Like that's right. The yeah. 49ers know know how much it hurts when you miss on a guy you, you trade up for. Yeah. Um, you only it, go to it, two NFC title games in a Super Bowl. Well, but you don't win those games. No, no, I know. I know. I'm being funny. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, just like, I, dude, I honestly dude, go ahead. They, they can't go into this year. We've had this exact conversation about the offensive line for the last three off seasons. They cannot go into this year going. Yeah. Hey, we have this guy who can compete at right tackle who we drafted in the first round. No, you have to be really confident when you select that player. It's you're like, he's the starting right tackle now. Colton McKibbins yeah. is going to be a swing tackler and he's going to compete at right guard. But right tackle is held down by this first round pick. And what you're saying, I am with you. Tyler Guyton, uh, uh, Marius Mims, uh, great, great, big athletic dudes for sure. A thousand percent. But huge question marks because they didn't play a lot in college. So I, I'm, I'm. I'm with you. I, I don't think that maybe if Amarius Mims falls to 31 and he's just kind of in their lap, then they're like, yeah, sure. But if they're going to move up for a player, whether it's trading a first next year to get into the top 15 or getting rid of, you know, one of their fourth round picks to, to get up into the mid twenties. Um, I, I, I think it has to be a player that they're confident will start right away. Because I have a question for you. You can't dick around at that spot anymore. I have a question for you, and I think it's a good podcast topic. <laughs> nice. Um, and and I so com I completely understand the positional value discussion that like obviously tackle is a way more valuable position than guard. Mm -hmm. But the question I would ask you, because I I have a very clear answer, which I'm I'm alluding to here, but which was a bigger issue for the 49ers? say this last season and the seasons prior was it right guard or right tackle in your mind um right right guard definitely has been a longer term issue but i think right tackle projecting out over the next five years i think it's harder to find a tackle than it is to find guards yeah, I totally agree. But I like if it comes to and like, look, ultimately what front offices do is say, you know, we got to have conviction. Right. So no matter who they pick, we really got to love this dude. Mm -hmm. Um. So but my point here would be that, like, yeah, you could upgrade at right tackle. 
But unless you really think Colton McKivitz is going to provide an upgrade at right guard, if you end up sliding him there, mm-hmm. you're still going to have an issue at right guard. Whereas I think if you were to upgrade somewhere along the interior, whether it's at center that moves Jake Brendel to right guard, or just, you know, I, I just feel like you could upgrade us like right guard is more problematic than right tackle, I guess is what I'm saying. But I'm fully on board with anyone who wants to tell me that right tackle is more of a priority because it's more of a premium position yeah. while also factoring in, you know, you, you might have to find a long-term replacement for Trent Williams that's and either this or after the next one. Yeah. And that's, that's another part of the, the, just going to call it the Amarius Mims discussion, because if you've not followed the draft super close, Amarius Mims is a tackle prospect out of Georgia who started, I think eight games and played fewer than a thousand snaps in college. But he has big time NFL size, big time athleticism. And okay, great. He may or may not develop as a right tackle, much less a player that you're confident can jump over and play on the left side. That's why like a guy like Jordan Morgan from Arizona is not projected to go. And again, this is all projection. Every year stuff happens in the draft that nobody had in their mock drafts and things shake out differently and things get weird. But the projections are that Mims is going to go. Um, what was I saying? Mims is going to go like middle of first, first round. round, right? Middle or yeah, late, middle, mid to late first round. Um, but jo- oh, Jordan Morgan, Jordan Morgan is where I was at. Thank you. So mm. <laughs> I didn't help you at all with that. <laughs> Jesus. Good lord, man! My cat started shitting, which is the the problem. There, we're fine now. In a litter but box, I hope. In a litter right? box, yes, of course. Okay, you have your litter box, and you have, you have the cat's litter box in your office. Uh, no, I have my office in the cat's litter box room. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever, oh cat, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I invade their space. No, so sure. so Jordan Morgan is a player who's not necessarily projected to go in the first round, and he played left tackle at Arizona. I think he'd be capable of flipping over and playing right tackle. And then you can jump and he you can move back to the left side when Trent Williams retires, you know, if he if if you think he's a, a good NFL player. And that's the kind of pick where I talk about high floor, low ceiling. I think Jordan Morgan is at least a capable player. Whether mm-hmm. whether, you know, he winds up staying on the right side or moving to the left side. And that's where I think if they they can stay at thirty one and probably get a tackle prospect that they feel pretty good about. And and I I don't I don't know that they'd want to shed draft capital to go up and and snag a snag a center when they have a player that they were confident enough in to give a four year deal to last year. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. I that's do like totally Jackson Howard Johnson though. Yeah. I just yeah. think like in, in terms of like just looking at players, you know, the handful of players I've looked at that are projected to go in the second half of the first round of like dudes that like, okay. I feel really comfortable saying this guy could play at a high level early on in his career and yeah, help yeah. me win a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And like, you're not projecting. And I think like, you know, the, the best example I could use for like a tackle, cause it happens a lot, right? I feel like tackles specifically. And the reason why I'm, I'm not super optimistic about a lot of these tackles that are expected to go in like the second half of the first round, including Mims is like, it's, it's like the Makai Becton thing or the Greg Robinson thing. You might have a complete Adonis as a player or as a prospect, but it doesn't mean they're going to be Tyron Smith, right? Like there's, you could be a complete freak show athletically, but the offensive line, particularly tackle is such, and even guard and center. I mean, there's such technical positions and you have to be so fundamentally sound that you can have all the physical traits in the world. It doesn't mean you're, mean you're going to be a good player. And Makai Becton is kind of like the classic example. Yep. Like the Jets had offensive line issues forever and they draft Makai Becton. And it's like, oh, well, this guy has all the physical tools you could ever want. 11th overall. Like he's huge. He's got long arms. He plays with, you know, great leverage, et cetera, et cetera. But guys just ultimately not that good at NFL football. Right. right. And, you know, it's not, that's not an only a tackle issue. But when I look at, you know, these tackles that are projected to go in the second half of the first round, I'm like, you're you're taking a you're taking a risk with a lot of these guys. Like, you don't know that these guys are good football players 
-hmm. And the 49ers, given their expectations and the way their roster is already built, Mm -hmm. they need guys that you could plug and play right now and know that they're good football players. And like the examples, but like the reason why there's risk always, though, there's always risk. But here's what I would say, like, why have the 49ers been so successful in drafting in the later rounds? Like, why do they why are they able to find Fred Warner and George Kittle and Dre Greenlaw and Talano Hufunga? Well, they get like, and this is gonna be super cliche football speed. Yes, yes. But it's like it's high football character guys. Yes. Gold it's Robert. guys that like you you know who are like I mean it's 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 what Brock Purdy is, right? First on the field, last off the field. <laughs> it is it's guys that you know are going to have the work ethic that you know have the intelligence that you know are just high quality high operating humans that maybe because you know they're going to fall a few rounds in the draft because they don't have the quote unquote elite physical traits but you, you know they're reliable you know they're you know they're they're made of the right things mentally and the reason why the 49ers have been success, like that's why the 49ers have been successful with some of these picks in the middle rounds is because that's what they prioritize. Mm-hmm. And my opinion is that's what they need to keep prioritizing is those intangible things that like, sure, maybe, you know, maybe Graham Barton doesn't have the same length and athleticism as some of these other dudes, but maybe he's just made of the right stuff and somebody who you could really rely on to be be just like an extremely reliable player mm-hmm. that 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 proves to be more valuable in the long haul over somebody who has longer arms might run a better 40 sure. might you know be more athletic like you know would you rather have would you rather have like Mackay Becton or you know whatever Joe Staley like back end of the first round guy Joe Staley was obviously very athletic mm-hmm. but Joe Staley was was less of a projection like from a mental and tangible standpoint coming out than some of these guys who have played very little football who are complete athletic freak shows, right? Mm-hmm. That's not to say Staley wasn't athletic. He was very athletic coming out, but like no, I'm just dragging saying, Joe Staley on this podcast. That's crazy. Friend of the pot. Shout out to Joe. But it's it, like he's he's he was a different prospect than like Makai Becton was. Yes. Right? Yeah. No. Right. He was a back end of the first round prospect, not a top. What did, what did Becton go? Six? Eleventh. Eleventh. A top ten ish guy. Yeah. So no, I I'm I I, I definitely get it. There's always going to be risk involved though, and always. that's why that's why part of me wonders if they wind up sitting at thirty one and taking a player like. Yeah, you know, maybe middle of the second round guy, but he checks all the boxes that you just. We're going to talk about like offensive linemen and like receivers and like, oh, are they going to draft somebody because they might not have like Debo Samuel after this upcoming season? And mm-hmm. and then it's just like, nope, sat at 31 and took Darius Robinson. <laughs> yeah. Defensive lineman from Mizzou or uh, Chop Bowl Robinson. Classic <laughs> champion, <laughs> Darius Robinson. Um, yeah, I do think like, it's worth... hey, it, it feels real quick. It does feel <clears> like just to put a bow on this and then we can move on to your thing. It feels like offensive line or defensive line unless they trade Brandon. Ayu. But I think they're, they're taking, I think they're, I agree, but I think they're adding to the trenches on one side or the other. Yes. Agree and... wholeheartedly. Um, and another re- like, People talk about wow, my voice. My voice is just it's, all over the it's place. It's fine. We're good. It's just like cracked. I'm I'm like super raspy, but also cracky voice guy. Um, I think it's interesting that people talk about this receiving class like it's super deep, or it's like an insanely top. Like, sure, like Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, really, really good prospects. Probably going to be like high level receivers as rookies. Do we know that Adani Mitchell and Ladd McConkley and Troy Franklin and Roman Wilson and all these other dudes are going to be good Jim from the McCon- jump? I think Ladd McConkey is going to be good as fuck. Wide receiver out of okay. Georgia. I am a big Ladd McConkey guy. He just so yeah, hard he, hat, he, lunch pail guy, <laughs> sneaky athlete. <laughs> <laughs> no, he and this is not. This has nothing to do with with the fact that he's a white dude. Um, 
he reminds me of Cooper Cup in the way that when you watch him play, he's just open all the time. Same thing, Brandon Ayuk, same way. Like you just watch it. It's like how is how do you not how does this guy not get 15 targets a game? He's just open constantly. And I could see that's another one where the 49ers sit at 31 and just draft Lad McConkey because Kyle Shanahan's like, I need this guy in the building. Because I just think he's a really, really good wide receiver. I think he's going to be good right away. And I think he's going to wind up with like the Bills or the Ravens or the Chiefs. In fact, the Chiefs. He's going to wind up on the Chiefs. <laughs> and everybody's going to be like, how did they let the Chiefs do? How did the league let Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid have Lad McConkey? Oh, my God. That's how it's going to be. And then they're going to win another Super Bowl. <laughs> I oh, guess and, I need to watch and national, more Lab and, and national, you do, and national <laughs> champion Roman Wilson. Obviously, shout out to Josh Duba. Niners are gonna are gonna draft a Michigan guy. I'm at like very one. confident, dude. At Zach, least one. We we're talking to interior lineman. Zach Zinter is just a hoss, dude. He's so fun. If the Lions don't draft him, the Niners are going to. Um, how do you pronounce the the cornerback's name? You can play uh play in the slot. Even begin to tell you. Sriffin oh, Strickenick or San 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 Ristril. Mike San, San Ristril. Ristril. I thought there was a Nick in there. Mike. He's a Mike. Mm-hmm. Um seems like somebody that they could take in the in the second round. Sure. Who's their kicker? How is he? <laughs> Oh boy. Um no, I I think it's going to be I'm with you. I'm totally with you. I think it's trenches. Like I I just if it's an edge guy, if it's a guy who plays on the edge but could also rush inside, I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I do think in free agency and and with the trade for um Malik Collins that <clears throat> the Niners don't absolutely have to add an interior defensive lineman. Like no doubt. if if there's one there, like, like you know, Byron they Murphy like the second from Texas. Yeah, if he's there, do it for sure. Yeah, but um, I do think they're in a they're in a spot where they don't necessarily have to. But like Darius Robinson makes sense. Chop Robinson makes sense. Um, offensive line, like we've talked about, absolutely makes sense. Receiver could make sense. Is there any like would would you be? Is there any position where you're like, there's, or what positions are you like, there's no chance they draft that position in round one? Quarterback. Okay. Running back. It's actually funny. I'm I'm going to write about this at Niners Wire when this podcast is over. It's the positions. Mm. Will they draft each position? Spoiler alert. Quarterback, no. Running back, no. Like hard nose on both of those. Wide receiver, definite possibility. Mm-hmm. Tight end, small possibility. Is there anybody in that in that realm who could be? If they trade up to like fifteen, I could see them drafting Brock Bowers from Georgia. If he falls that far, I don't think he will wind up. The Brock how Bowers, physical the is Brock, Brock Bowers? He is a load, bro. Go go throw on some Brock Bowers highlights and enjoy yourself. He's a he's a he's a hoss, dude. <laughs> and I think a lot of the like anti Brock Bowers stuff leading up to the draft has all been that pre-draft smoke. I he I don't think he gets past like 11 or 12. Oh, you think it's a smoke screen? I think there's a lot it's I don't know if you know this but it's lying season. <laughs> Napa's own Brock Bowers. Yes. What high school do you go? Do you go to Vintage? He went to the one where they crank out Justin Paul Sienna. Brock Bowers High this is School. Good podcasting. Where did he go? He's from Napa. Napa Val. Uh, Napa High. It says Napa High School. Okay. Brock Bowers Wikipedia. High school Napa. Parenthetical Napa. <laughs> <laughs> no, so he went to he went to Napa High School in S- Sonoma. Um, no, so <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, 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 very, very doubtful they take a tight end offensive line. Yes. Defensive line. Yes. Linebacker hard. Maybe 
hard, hard maybe. maybe hard maybe at linebacker depending on what yeah. they feel about Dre Greenlaw's future and then cornerback and safety I think it's a definite no I at first really? I started I started digging into the idea of them taking Mizzou and Cotton Bowl classic champion Ennis Rakestraw from mm. uh or or like Kool-Aid McKinstry from from Bama but dude you just start looking at their history they have never taken a cornerback earlier than the third round sure so I just I don't I don't think they're gonna suddenly I don't think the need at the position is so dire and I don't think they value the position enough to be like yeah hey we're back in the first round and we're just gonna go get a cornerback now I think a they like some of the players they have in the building, and b it, they'll just throw another couple of late round draft picks at it and see see who comes up. Have we talked about Isaac E. Autumn enough on this podcast? I don't think we've talked about him at all, which is just the right amount. <laughs> no. Well, it does seem like it does seem like they're kind of optimistic about you know him potentially playing a lot. Okay, so when he first signed. I just went to go look at his snap counts just to kind of see how much he'd been playing and stuff. He played a lot for the Saints last year and had a really, really good year for them. Yeah. Like had his best year defensively while also contributing on special teams. So yeah, you have Isaac Yadam, you have uh, Ambry Thomas who could conceivably compete there still. Darrell Luter, uh, Samuel Womack. Like they have a bunch of guys who have played NFL games, save for mm -hmm. Luter. He's mostly played on special teams, but uh, I, I think they, I think they like him a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if if um, they, like I said, throw a late round pick at corner and then let guys like Yadam and Thomas and Luter kind of duke it out. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Unless, um, unless the again, the, the one exception to this, to all of this stuff, is if their scouting department and front office is like, Ennis Rakestraw is the third best player in this draft. And he falls to him at 31. Then, then yeah, they they take him and get him in the building, but I don't think that's going to necessarily be the case. So, do you have any Tyler Newbin thoughts? Yeah, really good player. I don't know if he's a first round pick, but safety um, from Minnesota. Yeah, just a play. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> just break your chair or what? What just happened? <laughs> I thought I was adjusting the arms on my chair, and I adjust. I grabbed the. Uh, the seat lowering mechanism has dropped my ass out of my out of my chair. We're good. Here we go. One of a, one of our listeners slash viewers. Um, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, check it out. But should clip that and turn it into a GIF or a GIF, even or a GIF, whichever you prefer. But that was that was a <laughs> quality quality visual. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm sure it was. What were we What were we talking about? Uh, Tyler Newbin, safety from Minnesota. Yes, ball hawk, good player. That wouldn't um, surprise me. Turnover machine. I think one of the sneaky, and I know Mike Silver's alluded to it um, in some of his writings, but one of the sneaky things that we might want to look out for is, do the 49ers want to pay Talano Hufanga sure. um, beyond his rookie contract, and might they invest in a safety to pair with Jair Brown over the next you know, foreseeable yeah. future? Sure. Definite, definite possibility. I just don't, I don't think I see it this draft. It's a wild card. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, sure. Punter, no. Kicker, maybe. <laughs> Definitely not a punter. I'm offended that you even. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going to bring up a long snapper. Like, that's even a well, remote no. possibility. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Can I tell you two players I watched today that. Well, one player I watched a while ago and a player I learned about today and did a dive on today. That I really yeah, where, where where were you in um, your living room? Were you in your office? Nobody were you in... I was just neck deep in the lab. Okay, good. <laughs> so it was a serious eval then. Yeah, it I was, I was it inside was just the a lab. Haphazard. I was just okay. I was in the lab in my Duffy. Okay, great. I have a separate lab inside the. Inside I was the just making rack. sure this was a legitimate <laughs> eval and not like, oh, I was watching on my phone and no, you God. know in the bathroom. Yeah, you think yeah. I would? You think I would bring that horse shit to the pod? <laughs> I'm just <Please>. making sure. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, yeah. So here's two players that I couldn't like. I don't know. I I just like watching them. Jaheim Bell from Florida State. Mm. This dude is a tight end who I think the Niners would probably eventually convert to fullback because he's like 6'2", like 240, 2, 235, 240. Not a big dude. But throw on some Jaheim Bell and tell me he doesn't move like Debo. I don't think he's Debo. He's not, he's not that good. But he had 95 catches and 84 carries, I think, in college as a tight end. And a lot of what he did at Florida State was just, hey, he's going to line up as an H-back, and we're going to swing it to him in the flat, and he's just going to break a bunch of tackles and have a bunch of yards after the catch. So really fun player to watch and fits a position of need for the 49ers and possibly a long-term replacement for Kyle Juszczyk, maybe. Um, so I really like watching him. And then the guy I learned about today is Purdue running back Tyrone Tracy, mm. who was a wide receiver at Iowa for four years and then transferred to Purdue and became a running back and was just a really effective running back right away. He can also return kicks. And I don't think it's a Jalen Hurd situation where he went to receiver because Jalen Hurd went from running back to receiver because ironically he thought it would prolong his career. And with Tyrone Tracy he did the opposite. And you would never know that you could tell when Jalen Hurd played receiver, you would go like, Oh, that's not quite a receiver. And he definitely he knows a little bit what he's doing, but you can also tell he may have just picked up the position like a year ago. Tyrone Tracy, that's not the case for me as a running back. He's like super patient. The way he moves is just a little bit different. Uh, he's got really good balance. And he's still an effective receiver out of the backfield. And with his receiver background, he was literally wide receiver for four years at Iowa. I think you could use him in similar ways. Again, he's not Christian McCaffrey, not even close. But I think you could use him in similar ways where you could actually give McCaffrey a breather without having to redo your offense because you don't have somebody who can do the things he can do. Um, I think Tracy can still split out wide. He can catch passes out of the backfield. Um whether he can block in the NFL TBD, but I, I like all the, I like the tools and he was a fun player to watch. One he can return kicks. Yeah. 49ers need that. They don't have that guy just now. No, um, they don't have their kick returner. I think one thing that is interesting and maybe a little bit underrated or underappreciated when you talk about draft prospects, a lot of these guys might project to the NFL in different positions. And you just gave two examples there where they didn't really play all that much in college, right? Like mm -hmm. Fred Warner was a, like basically a nickel in college. Right. And he's like, Oh, is, you know, he's a linebacker, but do, do we really feel great about him being a linebacker? Well, it turns out all that work at nickel in college really helped him be great in coverage as a linebacker in the NFL. Right. George Kittle obviously played tight end, but because he was at Iowa where he had to block so much, he became such an elite blocker mm -hmm. that that helped him at the next level. Right. Like and because he wasn't this tight end who caught 100 passes a year in college, he was somebody who fell to the fifth round. There are ways to project and identify guys in college where you, you look at something and say, all right. Maybe he doesn't do this one thing at an NFL level that you would typically associate with a guy who would go in the first or second round, but he does this other thing to where if you take that and apply it to a new position, he becomes an extremely valuable player, yeah. right? So like, mm -hmm. um, there are like Richard Sherman, right? Ball skills. He was a receiver in, in college before transitioning to corner. Yep. Right. Like that there are and part the inexperience at corner was part of the reason why he fell to the fifth round of the draft. Right. But once he got to the league, his ball skills as a former receiver made him one of the best cornerbacks of his generation. Right. Yep. So there are there are things that, you know, I, I find like there are a lot of draft prospects who sort of defy. I don't want to say defy logic, but defy defy convention when it comes to, you know, why you think they'll be successful in the league. And it's like, well, this linebacker played defensive back in college and yeah, he's only 210 pounds. But, you know, after a couple of years in an NFL building with a nutrition program and a, and a weightlifting coach, 
Like all of a sudden this dude's 225 pounds and still has those coverage skills that he had in college. And now he's a super valuable player for us. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are examples um, all across the board, really like throughout the league that make, that make the draft process really interesting and make like, you know, all the pre-draft analysis of like, Oh, this guy can't do this. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you know, let's see what he looks like in the league. But yeah examples you gave are are valuable because sometimes there are dudes who do things in the league that you that make it like how am i how am i trying to say this like make dudes who end up being productive in the league for traits that they have in college that might make you believe they're not going to be first or second yes. round picks when they come out so ja, ja, an example i think of what you're saying is jaheem bell is gonna go like late day three because he is undersized at tight end and the idea of like lining him up in line and having him just be a horse as a blocker is just not a thing that's in the cards, but that doesn't mean he's, he can't play in the league. Like I still think there are tools that could make him a valuable player. It just may not be as the traditional tight end as his position would. Well, would and Kyle Juszczyk was a tight end in, in college, right? He went to Harvard by the way. Oh, did he? I didn't yeah. know that. No, sort of. No guy. one's ever mentioned yeah, that before. Guy. Wow, I'll have to bring bring that up with him next time we chat. <laughs> hey, and on top of that, did you know his wife, Kristen, made a jacket that Taylor Swift wore? Get out of town. I will not. Stay Get out right of here. town <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, I got nothing. I think, I think my voice is telling day. my voice is telling me to stop talking. Okay. We got a big day tomorrow, bro. You need to rest up. Yeah, we do. We do. I, I do need to rest up. I'm gonna. I need to Shout get like to Craig. 20, to 20 hours of sleep. Shout out to Craig. Um, yeah, man. Shout out to Craig in perpetuity. And uh, tomorrow will be fun. Well, yeah. like let's. Can well, we? we're gonna tease like tomorrow being cool. We're not ever gonna talk about it on the podcast. No, I don't think. God no. <laughs> Follow us on social if you want to see what's going on. Follow Kyle on social. I'm gonna. I'm yeah, gonna, don't, yeah don't. I'm gonna be off the socials. Yeah, maybe don't follow. Just check in on me. Uh, don't follow me. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. But yeah, check check in. We'll be it'll be cracking. Shout out to Craig. Shout out to Craig, as always. Shout out to shout out to Craig. Shout out to Lamb Chops. SGLambChops.com. Promo code Candlestick twenty. Get twenty percent off your order. And of course, Prize Picks. We love daily fantasy sports. That's PrizePicks.com slash Candlestick. Promo code Candlestick. Get a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. All right. Until next time. See you, everybody. See ya.